All right, um, good morning everybody and welcome to the third lecture on uh, uncertainty in computational geometry. So uh, in the first lecture I gave a big overview, in the second one I talked about how to compute lower and upper bounds on uh, geometric measures and in this lecture I want to talk about uh, pre-processing. So it's a different uh, uh, paradigm maybe of what you can do in the presence of uh, imprecision. So let me first uh, explain a bit what this idea is about. Um, so in this pre-processing paradigm, the idea is that, well, even if we have uncertain data right now, maybe uh, it's not always going to be uncertain. Maybe later we will be able to measure better where our points are, or uh, for some other reason we get uh, more precise information later. And the question is really, okay, given that I now have imprecise data and maybe later I get precise data and I want to compute something on this precise data, how much of this computation can I already do now? Okay, so we're given in the beginning a set of regions, like here, and these regions are imprecise points, so every region contains one point, same model as before. And later, Maybe soon we get another uh, set P, and P is the actual point, okay? So P is one point inside every set. And um, what we want to do is compute some property of P, maybe uh, uh, the Delaney triangulation or minimum spanning tree or convex hill or, or whatever. Okay, so we want to compute this, maybe a triangulation of the point set. and. Uh, if so one, th one way to compute it is of course to just wait until we have P and then use our favorite uh, known algorithm for computing the structure S of P but maybe this algorithm is somehow slow so for example if, the, if we want to triangulate the point set it's known that we cannot do this faster than n log n time um, and maybe we don't have that time when we get P because when we get P we really quickly want to know S of P so how much of this computation can we already start doing uh, right now. Okay, so the idea is that we, maybe we can compute some sort of intermediate structure. Uh, let's call it H. So H of R is some sort of structure. I don't know what it is, uh, but it's something that we can compute from R that helps us compute S of P faster than without the structure. Okay, so once we get P, we want to compute uh, S of P using H of R and P uh, so we want to compute, so we want to find an algorithm here that gives us S of P given these two things, which should be faster than this algorithm. All right, that's the, that's the general idea. And there are, are several results of this type. Um, so some of them are known for uh, triangulations. There's an algorithm by Held and Mitchell that says you can compute the triangulation of a point set in linear time. Um, after you compute the, the right kind of pre-processing, whereas doing it directly would, co would cost n log n time. Uh, Held and Mitchell do this for unit disks and we uh, extend this algorithm to arbitrary uh, polygonal regions or even arbitrary regions uh, in a plane as long as they're disjoint. And this algorithm, this result I will talk about in detail. Uh, for the Lani triangulations, you can uh, also do the same thing, but not for arbitrary regions, only for disks. Um, and there are also some results that say you can not compute a structure in linear time, but still faster than n log n time. For example, uh, convex hulls and onions, and I'll also talk about the onions in a bit more detail later, and maybe if there's enough time, I'll talk about the Lani triangulations as well, but I'm not convinced that there will be enough time. Okay, so is the, the, the paradigm clear? So then let's talk about uh, how do we solve this problem if we want to compute the triangulation of a set of points. Okay. Um, so we are given this set of regions in the plane and I'm gonna assume that they are uh, polygons and that they are disjoint. So something like this. Okay, and then according to the paradigm, later I will get one point inside every polygon. Um, Oh, sorry, we want to compute some uh, uh, intermediate structure H. 
And then later, we get one point per region, and the idea is that if we use this magic structure, we can triangulate the points in the near time. Okay, that's the, the goal. And the question is, of course, what is this structure H, and how do we compute it, and then how do we compute the triangulation? Okay, so before I'm going to uh, solve this problem, I'm first going to solve a different problem, which turns out to be useful. Um, so the different problem that I want to solve is the following. Suppose I am given already a triangulation of a set of points in the plane, but the points have two colors. I have red points and I have blue points, like this here. I hope the color is uh, a bit visible, but this one is, for example, red and this one is blue. Um, so I have a triangulation of red and blue points, and what I want to do is get a triangulation of only the blue points. Okay, so some blue points are already connected, like this one and this one, and some are even already forming triangles, so that's great. I can just use them in my triangulation, but some blue points are not connected because there's red points in between them that are blocking the connection. And what I want is to get rid of all the red points and their connections and then have a triangulation of the blue points. But of course, if I just throw away all the red points and their connections, then I may have uh, just isolated points and triangulating them would cost n log n time. So can we still do this in uh, linear time? Well, the answer is yes, we can do this, and I'm going to tell you how. Um, so the main idea of how to do this is, well, suppose that we have uh, a constant degree red vertex like maybe this vertex is red and it has only one, two, three, four, five edges, that's constant. Or this one is red and it has only four edges. So what we can do is just uh, pick some vertex of degree at most five. It's known if a, a triangulation is a planar graph, so there must be a vertex of degree at most five. We can remove such a vertex, like this one has degree five. I can remove it in constant time. I get a gap of constant size. I can retriangulate this gap in constant time like this. And now I have a, a point set with one plus uh, one fewer point. So uh, if I just do this and I spend constant time per point, of course I can remove uh, some set of points in linear time. Uh, it takes constant time per red point. Uh, of course, there's a slight problem here. So I said I want to remove a constant degree red vertex and I say there is always a degree of uh, a most constant degree, but of course maybe all the points of constant degree are not red. That's possible, right? Maybe I have something like this, where I have lots of blue points and there's a bunch of red points that are still in there and all the red points have high degree. Well, then uh, this approach doesn't work because if I now just remove this uh, red point, then it takes maybe linear time and I have to retriangulate the gap, and this takes too long. Okay. Um, of course, we cannot say, well, then let's just pick a blue point of constant ti uh, degree and remove that and retriangulate, because then later I have to insert it again, and it's not so clear where I have to re reinsert it. Um, so, the solution to this uh, slight problem is to maintain not a triangulation of the points, but a pseudo triangulation. Right, so pseudo-triangulation is uh, a subdivision of the plane into pseudo-triangles. Um, a pseudo-triangle is a, is a uh, polygon with exactly three uh, convex vertices. So this is a pseudo-triangulation, maybe. So in general, a pseudo-triangle looks like this. Something like this. Okay, so it's a polygon which has three uh, convex vertices, just like a triangle, and then there's a bunch of concave vertices in between. And uh, the, the kind of pseudo-triangles that we need are only uh, pseudo-triangles that have uh, uh, two straight edges between uh, their three vertices and one concave chain. So at every red point, and maybe have some edges that go to other points in 
and then in between I have some uh, I may have some concave chain that consists only of blue points and the idea is that uh, this way we can ensure that there is always a, a constant degree red point okay because I, I don't need too many edges in between to all of these blue points uh, but I do uh, require that I have an edge between uh, every pair of red points or every pair of red points that was connected in the triangulation. Okay, so um, this is the main idea, okay? So if we, we have some sort of a pseudo triangulation like this, then I have constant degree red points and then maybe I can remove them in constant time. Well, certainly I can remove them in constant time and maybe I can re pseudo triangulate this gap uh, in constant time, well, it turns out we cannot because the size of the gap is not actually constant. So there may be a linear number of points on one of these concave chains, um, but it turns out we can re-pseudo triangulate such a gap in time logarithmic of the number of points uh, on those chains, and this is good enough. Okay, so but in order to make this work, we first need the pseudo triangulation, and we were given a triangulation. So we need some way to simplify a red point in time linear in its degree, okay? So we have uh, um, a red point which has too many neighbors and I want to simplify it and the, and the property that I'm going for is that the number of blue neighbors should not be more than the number of red neighbors plus maybe some constants. Okay, so maybe this is my situation in the input, I look at one red point and all of its neighbors, and it has more than a constant number of neighbors. Um, some of its neighbors are red, and most of its neighbors are blue. And I want to turn this into a situation where I have, so I have right now one, two, three, four red neighbors. So I should have at most four uh, <coughs> plus some, uh, uh, some constant number of blue neighbors. Um, so how do we do it? Well, we first remove all of the red-blue uh, edges in this uh, local configuration, like this. So now I have uh, only red-red edges, but it's not really a pseudo-triangulation because, uh, well, right here, for example, this red vertex is convex, or this red angle is convex, and also inside here there are some blue convex angles. So I need to add some edges back but I want this property that there should not be too many more uh, blue neighbors than red neighbors. So how do we do it? Um, so I add edges to all the blue neighbors of the red red edges, like this. So for every uh, red red edge, I add at most two red blue edges, <coughs> and sometimes fewer because these red red edges were already neighbors, which means that this is already a triangle and therefore also a pseudo triangle. Um, and then for uh, the remaining part here, um, I just compute the convex hull of this uh, blue chain here, uh, or convex path. And uh, I do the same here. So this is now convex and this one here was already uh, a convex chain. And then inside these regions that I create, I may have uh, some polygons that I still need to triangulate, but this is fine because these polygons only have blue vertices, so I can just triangulate them and, and they're already fine for the output triangulation. So I can spend as much time on them as I want. All right. So uh, how much time did this take? Well, it was uh, uh, um, linear time to remove all those edges and then <coughs> um, yeah I added some edges uh, near to the uh, red red edges um, which took constant time per red red edge and then I computed these convex chains and maybe I uh, really pseudo triangulated uh, or sorry uh, I triangulated some of these gaps which means that uh, this took linear time in the degree of this red point that I simplified all right, so I can do this to all, all of my red points and then I have a pseudo triangulation. 
Um, but we then also still need a way to remove a constant degree red point and re pseudo triangulate the gap. Okay? And this is maybe the more tricky part. So let's say my red point has uh, at most five red neighbors, so there must always be a red point with at most five red neighbors because the red red connect connection graph is uh, planar, so we must have this property. And if a red point has at most five red neighbors, then it has at most a constant number of neighbors in total because we just uh, ensured this property that no point has many more blue than red neighbors. So we can always find such a point. Now the question is, what do I do if I want to remove this point and uh, re pseudo triangulate the gap, right? Okay, so uh, we're gonna do this in log B time, where B is the total complexity of uh, the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the edge of this region, so the, the number of uh, blue points on all of these concave chains together is B. And in log B time, we can uh, uh, re triangulate this gap. So how do we do this? Uh, well, we first just remove the red point and all of its edges. And now we have uh, some region here which has order B complexity. Um, we compute the shortest path between all the remaining red points. So we have now four red points on the boundary. And I compute, uh, well, the pairwise shortest path between all of these pairs of red points. There's only constantly many. How do we compute such a path? Well, for this we need to do some tangent queries. So this chain of blue points here uh, may of course have uh, order B complexity, and I have to compute this query that says, well, given this red point, if I sweep a line, which blue point do I hit first? But for this, there are known data structures that can solve this in uh, log B time. So we use those, and then we can compute these shortest paths in log B time for all pairs of red points, and then using them, we compute um, a pseudo triangulation of the, of the red points. Um, but of course, some of the outside gaps may not be pseudo -triangu triangles yet. Um, but for those new faces, we can just uh, compute a new pseudo triangulation. Um, I think even in uh, constant time now, because we don't have to do any tangent queries, we just have to. Uh, no, I think we do have to do constant uh, tangent queries. So this also takes log p time. So for example, from this red point, I compute the tangent to this curve, uh, or from this one, I computed it to this curve. And then um, we get a, a new pseudo triangulation. Okay, so this takes log B time. Um, so now what's the, the global strategy? So first we, we turn our triangulation into a pseudo triangulation. Then uh, we search for a constant degree red point. Uh, we remove it and we re pseudo triangulate the, the gap. And we keep doing this until there are no more uh, red points. And then, of course, at the end, we have a triangulation of the blue points. In fact, not a pseudo triangulation, but a triangulation between, because all the pseudo triangles that we maintain in this procedure have uh, a red tip. And if there are no more red points, there are no more pseudo triangles. But how much time does it take? Well, so one way to analyze it is to look at the running time, uh, is, is to uh, group the, uh, uh, the uh, red points we remove into phases. So let's say in the first phase, there's some constant fraction of red points that we can remove. So we are removing all of the red points which have a uh, degree lower than a given constant. This means we can uh, find an independent, a set of independent red degrees of uh, some fraction, at most one over F times uh, the total number of red points that are left. So we remove this uh, one minus one over F fraction of red points. And this takes time. Um, in the worst case, each of these red points has exactly uh, uh, this one over K fraction of blue points in its neighborhood, I mean, of course, it's possible that one has many blue points and the others have few blue points, but that's, uh, uh, 
that's faster than if the blue points are nicely distributed over all the red points. So in the worst case, we get this uh, k times log n over k uh, time to execute one phase if k is the number of red points that are still left. Okay. So this means, so how many phases are there? Well, if we want to remove all the uh, red points and we're removing this factor f of them in every phase, then we get log base f of n phases. And after every phase, the number of red points that are left are, well, n divided by f, divided by f, divided by f, divided by f, uh, i times, if we are in the i-th phase. So this means, uh, after the i-th phase, k will be equal to n over f to the power i. Okay, so now we can fill this in. So the total running time is the sum over all the phases. So the, there are log base f of n phases. So we sum i from 1 to log base f of n. Um, and the time it takes to execute one phase is, well, this time, k times log n over k, but k equals n over f to the i. So this becomes n over f to the i log f to the i, okay? So we can just uh, compute this. So f is some constant. Um, and this expression now only depends on this constant f. Um, so if you uh, do the math here, I'm sure you already all uh, did this in your head and you see that yes, indeed, this is just a fancy way of writing O of n. So uh, the total running time is linear and we are uh, we're happy. Okay. Any question about uh, uh, this problem? All right. So we now know how to, uh, uh, in linear time, compute a triangulation of only the blue points if we're given a triangulation of red and blue points. So now how do we uh, use this to solve our original problem? Uh, well, actually, now that we know how to do this, the original problem is uh, actually not so hard to solve. So remember, we were given our set of uh, regions, which are disjoint polygons in the plane. So something like this. And what we want to do is compute some structure such that later when we get one point inside every region, we can triangulate those points in linear time. Well, maybe it's already, uh, you already have an idea of what the structure could be. The structure is a triangulation of the vertices of the region. Okay, so we have this uh, set of regions. And in our pre-processing phase, we simply look at all the vertices of these regions and we compute some triangulation. Uh, so the edges of the region are gonna be in the tri triangulation and then I just add some uh, uh, other edges to triangulate this. So of course, computing this triangulation of the regions takes n log n time, but that's fine because we're pre-processing and we have time to spend. And now, uh, this is our magic structure H. So it's just a triangulation of the vertices of the regions. And now later we get our uh, set of points P. So what are these points? Well, they are uh, one point inside each of these regions. Um, and now the idea is we just add these points to our triangulation. So for this, we have to uh, locate them in the triangulation and add them to the triangulation and you may think, well, point location takes uh, log n time, so this will take n log n time. Uh, but that's not really true because we can just store uh, in the preprocessing for every region the set of triangles that covers this region, and then we can do point location in linear time. So we locate every point in the triangle where it is and connect it to the three vertices of this triangle. We get something like this. And this is now a triangulation of red and blue points, so we can forget about the regions. Uh, we have a triangulation of red and blue points, and we want a triangulation of the blue points. Well, we just saw how to do it. So we use this algorithm, and uh, we get our triangulation of just the blue points. Um, and this took only linear time. Okay? So that's the whole, the whole algorithm. So once we know how to solve this last phase of how to uh, compute triangulation of blue points given a red-blue triangulation. Uh, the rest is uh, uh, fairly straightforward. 
um, and this works for uh, it, uh, the requirement that the regions are disjoint is necessary because, uh, well, if all the regions overlap each other, then there's obviously nothing you can do to preprocess the points. Uh, the requirement that they are polygonal is not necessary because you can always, uh, if they're not polygonal, draw some polygons around them and you get slightly bigger regions that are still disjoint and you can still do the same thing. Um, okay, any question, uh, questions about this first problem? Yes. Okay, so uh, in principle, if we want to uh, uh, add these blue points into the red triangulation, we have to find out for every point in which triangle it is. And if we would just use some point location data structure, this would take log n time. However, we know because we pre-processed this triangulation, uh, we know which vertices belong to which region. So we can add uh, a pointer from every vertex to the region and uh, conversely from the region to uh, the points that make up this region. So now if I, if I get a point in this region, I only have to look at those vertices that make up this region. And now the triangulation of this region uh, is actually just a tree structure. So if I get a point in this region, um, well actually, if I get a point in this region, the easiest thing to do is just uh, start looking at some triangle, triangle of this region and then look, well, is my point in this triangle, yes or no? And I look in all the triangles in this region and then I can find the point in time proportional to the number of triangles in this region. But since the total number of triangles is linear, this still takes linear time. Yes? F here. F is uh, some constant. It's uh, the fraction of points we can remove. So the idea is um, if I have some triangulation and in every triangulation, uh, in, at some point I have k red points left, and now I want to remove some of those red points uh, uh, which have small degree. Um, how many can I remove at the same time? And uh, it turns out that there's always some constant fraction uh, of red points F, uh, some constant fraction F of red points that I can remove because they're independent. So in a way, F is uh, the size of the smallest possible independent sets in the red-red uh, 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 connection graph. Okay, and this is a constant. Yes? Uh, yeah, so, so N is the total complexity of all the input regions. Sorry, I should uh, say this, yes. So, Yeah, yes, of course. So, so if the complexity is much higher than the number of regions, then, then the running time will depend on the complexity of the regions, not on the number of regions. So yes, this is uh, good to mention. So n is not the number of imprecise points, it's the total complexity of the imprecise points. So of course, if every imprecise point has constant complexity, then this is the same thing, which is usually the case. But if it's not, then, then it, uh, it depends on the complexity. In principle, you can, uh, as long as the region uh, has constant description complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then it's the... Yes, yes. Yes, so it's the complexity then of the polygons that you need to uh, cover these regions, yes.
more questions? Okay, then I think we uh, move on to the next problem. Ah, we are not in the last slide. Pre-processing onions. Okay. Um, so for this problem, I, I, I'm going to talk a bit about onions. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, if P is a set of n points in the plane, like here, then uh, the onion layer decomposition of P, uh, or in short, the onion of P, is um, the convex hull of P, but recursive. Okay, so I take the convex hull of P, like here, and now I look at all of the points that are not on the convex hull, just this smaller set of points here, and then again I take the convex hull of those points. Okay? And recursively I keep doing this, I take the convex hull of the remaining points, and this is a single point, so the convex hull is just a single point. And this set of uh, nested convex polygons is the onion layer decomposition, or in short, the onion of uh, P. Okay, onions have many applications in many uh, uh, geometric algorithms. Uh, and uh, they're very useful. Uh, so the question is now, can we actually compute them uh, efficiently in this pre-processing uh, paradigm? Okay, so the onion pre-processing problem. Um, just to reiterate uh, uh, what the problem looks like, we're given a set of n uh, disjoint regions. And for this problem, I'm going to assume they're unit disks because uh, this problem is harder than the previous one, so we need simpler regions. Uh, so here are n disjoint unit disks. Well, they're supposed to be disjoint. These ones don't look very disjoint, but they should be disjoint. Um, and the preprocessing algorithm says, uh, again, compute some intermediate structure H. We don't know what it is, some structure, and then uh, later we get uh, precise points, and we want to compute the onion of these precise points using H uh, faster than n log n time. Okay, so again, the onion can be computed in n log n time, and we want to do it faster. Uh, okay, so we are going to show how to do it in uh, uh, n log k time, where k is the number of layers in uh, the onion decomposition. All right, so the preprocessing uh, algorithm is going to be, we have this set uh, of n disjoint unit disks, and on this set, I will compute um, some sort of a subdivision, uh, a spatial subdivision tree. Okay, so first, uh, we observe that there always exists for such a set of disks a line that intersects not too many disks and that has roughly half of the disks on each side of the line. Okay, so intuitively, if you have a bunch of unit disks and they're disjoint, then I should be able to, to separate them by some line and if I don't pick the wrong orientation, then the line shouldn't intersect too many of them. Uh, so a line like this, it intersects only two disks and there are a constant fraction of disks on this side and a constant fraction on that side. Um, and this is indeed true. You can compute such a line that intersects at most uh, uh, square root of n log n disks by, uh, uh, as a result, by uh, Alon et al. Um, and we will use this to iteratively subdivide our disks in a, into a tree structure. Okay, so we take one, of su one such line, and then uh, on both halves of the line, we include this disk on this side and on this side, and then we recursively apply the same lemma. So uh, on the left and on the right, we compute another line, and then again, we subdivide the smaller regions, and then we subdivide them again and again. And uh, eventually, uh, we get a tree where in every leaf there is only a single disk. And a disk may appear in multiple leaves, but uh, every leaf has at most one disk. And because of this lemma that says every line doesn't intersect too many disks, 
uh, we can prove that the total complexity of this tree is still only linear. Um, oh, I needed one more level because these were not yet separated. Um, so we call this tree T and um, well, we, we claim that T has uh, a linear number of leaves and the depth of T is only log n plus some constant, okay? So uh, the number of times I have to subdivide one side until I get only a single point, uh, a single disk in my leaves is uh, not much more than logarithmic, okay? So we can create this tree. Why is this interesting? Well, uh, uh, this tree is actually our uh, magic structure H. So, okay, so in this case, H is the tree, and in the pre-processing, we don't do anything except for compute this uh, space division tree on our set of disks. Okay, takes uh, uh, um, slightly more than n log n time to compute this uh, tree, but it's the pre-processing phase, so we don't really care about running time. Uh, the main question is how can we use this tree to compute the onions uh, faster than in analog n time, okay? So the reconstruction algorithm. Suppose I have my set of disks like this and I have this tree and I get a set of points in my disks. How do I compute the onion of those points? Well, the first thing to do is to uh, locate those points in the disks and, uh, and therefore in the tree, but again, I can just store a pointer from every disk to the leaf of the tree they are in. Um, so this we can just do in linear time. So I have a set of points and I know where they are in my tree. And the idea is that I'm going to recursively uh, compute the onion by first computing the onion of every point set in the leaves. Well, if, it's, if a leaf has a single point, then the onion is just the single point itself. Um, and then recursively, uh, I go up the tree, and for every uh, uh, pair of siblings, I uh, compute the onion of the, uh, the point sets of those two siblings together. So first, um, well, if there's any empty leaves, we can remove them. Of course, there can be empty leaves because one uh, disk, if you remember, could intersect with multiple leaves. So remove all the empty leaves. And then for any pair of uh, neighboring onions, we unite them, okay? So we go one level up the tree, which means we remove uh, some of these edges, which means now we have two onions that are in the same cell, and I want only one onion per cell, so I compute the, the union of these two onions. Okay, how do we, uh, what does this look like? Well, if these are single points, then the union is just gonna be a segment. So now I have some segments and maybe some still uh, single points in my tree. And I just go up the tree, I remove again these uh, edges and I compute the unions of my onions. Right now they're still all convex polygons, but if I go one more level up, maybe I get some onions which have multiple layers. And I go another level up and another level up and another level up. And in the end, I've computed the onion of my entire point set. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, of course, the question is how much time does this take? Uh, and for this, the main thing we need to know is, well, how do we actually unite two onions? How do you compute the union of two onions? Okay, because we do this in every step. How efficient is it actually? Okay, so we need to uh, solve this sub-problem maybe of uh, computing the union of two onions. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we have two onions and I want to compute their union. So the, the onion of the union of the two point sets. Um, so the observation is if I have two onions already and the total number of points in those two onions is n, then I can find the convex hill in log n time. So I can find the outer layer of these onions in log n time. And how do I do this? Well, again, using the same kind of tangent queries that we saw in the, uh, in the previous uh, topic. So we can uh, build a data structure that allows us to uh, compute the tangent between these two outer layers. And then 
uh, this gives me the convex hull. I can compute it in just logarithmic time. And now the idea is, well, if I compute this convex hull, now I only need to find the, uh, uh, the onion of all the points inside here. So I just uh, remove the convex hull, and I'm left with this. And so this is not really two onions anymore. That's a bit of a problem. So I cannot just recurse and again compute the convex hull, because if I compute the convex hull of the next two layers, maybe I get this edge here, which doesn't include this point. So I might miss something. So these are two, let's call them uh, half-eaten onions, and uh, uh, we cannot compute their convex hull, so I have to uh, restore them. So I want to uh, uh, take one of these half-eaten onions and turn it back into a proper onion, okay? Uh, so for this, we use uh, uh, onion restoration uh, and unification algorithm. So we have two of these uh, uh, onions that are not uh, proper onions anymore, but we can compute the convex hull of one of these guys in um, log n time, okay? Because this guy consists of one onion and half of an, a layer of an onion. So I can compute the tangent from this endpoint to this onion again in logarithmic time, okay? So we get these two convex hulls of the individual onions and now we remove move those, and then we observe that what we're left with inside is again a half-eaten onion. So this is some onion and half of one layer. So again, I can compute the convex hull of this in log n time, uh, like this. And then after this, I'm left with another half-eaten onion in here. So I have this half chain and a single point, and again, I can compute the, the tangent from this point to this onion, which is a single point in log n time. Okay, so I do this and now I have two proper onions. And now that I have two proper onions, I can again go back to the previous step and compute the convex hull of both of the onions uh, like this. And this is the second layer of the, the union that I wanted to compute. So I set this aside and uh, remove it and I'm left again with two half-eaten onions and I restore those onions using the same procedure as before, like this, and now I have two proper onions again, and I can take their convex hull. I get the third layer of my union. Uh, I have two of these half-eaten onions, I restore them, I take the convex hull, I do the same thing once more, I take the convex hull, and now I have one, two, three, four, five layers of the onion. So how much time did this, did this take? Well, if uh, the total number of layers here is k, then this took k squared log n time. Okay, why? Because uh, computing one of these outer convex holes took log n time, but then to restore the two onions, I had to uh, compute, uh, uh, recompute their layers k times, and every time took log n time. So it actually took k times log n time just to compute one of these layers. And I did this k times, so the total running time here is k squared times log n. Okay, still k, k squared times log n is uh, reasonably efficient, especially if the onion doesn't have too many layers. Okay, it's faster than, uh, than uh, the n log n time that it would take to compute it from scratch as long as k is smaller than square root of n, uh, bigger than square root of n, okay? So this is how we unite uh, two onions. Okay, now then we just have to plug this back into the uh, overall algorithm. <coughs> so for the final result, um, we have this uh, set of unit disks, which we, uh, 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 we can uh, split and turn into this uh, uh, tree, T, uh, which takes n log n time. And then uh, we can unite onions pairwise in k squared log n time. Um, and using this algorithm, we can reconstruct uh, uh, the, the whole onion in n log k time. Um, 
So why is it n log k time? Well, we have uh, at most n levels in our tree. And uh, for every level, we have to compute this union of this onion. But at the bottom levels, the uh, number of um, points in inside each leaf is so small that we just use a brute force algorithm to compute the onions in, um, uh, well, let's say, m log m time, if there are m points in this layer. Uh, and at some point, once uh, the number of layers in our onion uh, becomes sufficiently small compared to n, we switch to using uh, the other unification algorithm. And then we do the math, and we get uh, uh, this n times log k running time uh, for the final algorithm. And this is uh, uh, not always faster than n again, of course, if the onion turns out to have a linear number of layers, well, then this is not faster than computing the onion just from scratch. But in this case, um, we also have a, a matching lower bound that says we cannot do anything better than compute it from scratch. But if the onion has fewer layers, then it works in n log k time, which is faster. OK. Any questions about uh, onion preprocessing? Yes. If we have it, then we call If we have, sorry? If we have it, then we call it, then we I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Any other questions? OK, then I think we, we have some time to uh, go to the, the third problem I uh, want to talk about as well. Um, that's right, right? I, I still have yes. time. Yes, OK. Uh, OK, so let's talk about uh, preprocessing for Delaunay triangulation. So in the first uh, uh, topic, we saw how to um, preprocess a set of points to compute a triangulation of the point set. Um, now we want to not compute any triangulation, but a specific one, namely the Delaunay triangulation. Okay. Um, so everybody knows the Delaunay triangulation. Okay. Then, uh, uh, of course, it's harder to compute the Delaunay triangulation than a normal triangulation, uh, than any triangulation, because it's a specific one, but you can still compute it in n log n time. Um, and still we want to compute it faster. Um, but because it's harder, it only works for more restricted types of regions. So here also we will assume the regions are unit disks. And in fact, if the regions would be arbitrary polygons, then we can show a lower bound that shows this is not possible and, and we need n log n time even after any kind of preprocessing. But for unit disks, we can uh, uh, preprocess them and compute the Delaunay triangulation in linear time. So I'll try to give an idea of how this works. Uh, for this one, I don't think I can give all the details, but hopefully give a, a bit of an overview of how it works. Um, so first, we will define uh, the concept of expanded Gabriel disks. OK, so if you have two points, P and Q, then uh, the normal Gabriel disk of P and Q is simply uh, this disk, right? It's a disk that has P and Q. Uh, on, on uh, opposite sides of the disk. Uh, and we call it CPQ. And uh, the expanded Gabriel disk is simply uh, the same thing, but we increase the radius by two. Okay? So this here is the expanded Gabriel disk, and I call it C plus of P and Q. Okay. Um, Lemma about expanded Gabriel disks. Um, if no point lies inside C plus of P and Q, 
then p hat q hat is an edge of t hat. Okay, so what does this mean? I'm uh, using a lot of notation here that I didn't define. Um, so p is my set of uh, disk centers. Okay, so p and q are imprecise points because they have a unit disk around them. And p hat and p and q hat are gonna be my real points. Okay, so I'm gonna have some real points p hat that's within distance one from p. I'm gonna have some real point q hat that's within distance one from q. And I want to compute the Delaunay triangulation of the points with hats, uh, and I call this t hat. Okay, so I get these disks here around p and q. They are, these are unit disks. Um, and Inside these unit disks, I get my real points at some point. So these are the points of which I want to compute the Delaunay triangulation. Um, and so my, uh, my um, lemma here says that if this green disk doesn't contain any other point, then I will have an edge between those two red points in my Delaunay triangulation, basically because this red circle here through them must be empty. If this red circle is not empty, then it must be because there's another red point inside this circle, but then this red point must be inside uh, an imprecision disk, and the center of that imprecision disk must lie inside this green circle. In the worst case, this red disk could, uh, this red circle could correspond with the blue one, and then this point could be exactly on this green edge, but uh, it cannot be outside, okay? So if there is no point um, inside this green disk, then I know for sure that I have an edge in my Delaunay triangulation. Okay, so then the uh, uh, idea is to uh, find maybe this, uh, these green disks for all my pairs of uh, imprecise points, and then just look for the ones that don't have uh, another point inside them and then I know for sure that those pairs must have a Delaunay edge, so those I can just pre-compute. And if I'm lucky, then maybe this gives me already the whole triangulation and I'm done. Of course, I probably won't be lucky. Okay, so in, pre in the pre-processing, we will uh, compute a minimum spanning tree of the imprecise points. Um, okay, so the minimum spanning tree, we just compute on P, so on the centers of the unit disks. So we have our uh, set of centers of unit disks, and I just compute the minimum spanning tree. And for every edge of the minimum spanning tree, I compute this expanded Gabriel disk. Okay, so I get, for every edge, I get one of these disks, and I, this edge here has this disk, and I get this big mass of disks in total. Um, but we can already see that for some of them, like this disk here, it doesn't contain more than those two points. Uh, but some of them, like this disk here, for this edge, it does contain another point. Okay, and now I will just uh, store for every expanded Gabriel disks uh, a list of all the points that are inside this disk. Okay, and uh, we prove that the total complexity of all of these lists is just linear. So even though there's uh, a linear number of Gabriel disks, and a linear number of points, and in principle one disk could contain a linear number of points. Uh, because we take the minimum spanning tree, we can prove that the total number of points in all of these lists together is just linear. Um, and now the approach is going to be, well, if I now get my real points, I'm going to locally connect the points along these edges of the minimum spanning tree, and if it so happens that there are no points in this disk, then this is easy, I can just compute the direct connection. But if there are points in it, then I may have to do something more clever. But uh, the point is that I only have to look at the points inside this disk uh, to do the more clever thing. Okay, so what's the, what is this clever thing that we're going to do? Um, well, Let's phrase it uh, uh, in independent terms. So given a point set P and it's the Lani triangulation and some circle C. Okay, this is any point set, any circle. Then uh, an edge of the Delaunay triangulation 
is certified by this circle C, if there is an empty circle that supports the edge that lies completely inside this circle. Okay, so those edges are certified by C because the edges lie completely inside the circle and for each of the edges I can draw an empty circle that lies inside C. Um, sorry, so, so these are the edges that lie completely inside C and those that are certified are those for which I can draw an empty circle in C. So for example, this is an empty circle which means this edge is certified and this edge is certified and this edge is certified. But this edge here is not certified by C because uh, if I draw an empty circle that doesn't contain any points in here, then the circle doesn't lie completely inside C. Okay, so this edge is not certified, so we don't have it in our set of certified edges. And also, similarly, these edges are not certified, but these are certified. Okay. And we claim that the uh, uh, graph of certified edges inside such a circle is connected. Okay, and why is this useful? Well, it's useful, um, ah, I'm actually going to prove this uh, lemma. Um, so, proof of this lemma, why is this connected? Well, uh, just take any point in here and uh, look at the center of the disk and start growing uh, a small circle towards the center of the disk until it touches another point. And then, because I started growing from an empty circle, this must give me uh, an empty circle that lies completely inside C that connects two points, okay? So for every point I can do this, and then I can continue growing from the next point until I hit the center of my circle. And then I just keep growing until I pass the center of my circle and I hit some other point and I find another edge. And from there I go to the center of the circle and well here so I find the same edge again so I stop and I uh, do the same thing starting from some other point that I haven't connected yet. So I start growing towards the center. From here I start growing towards the center. From here I start growing towards the center. And from here also. And since I can do this for every point I always end up with the same uh, point, namely the one closest to the center, which is this one. And uh, this means that this graph is connected. Okay? All right. Um, so why is it useful that this, uh, yes, sorry? Okay, so so this and it's it's still an empty circle because um, there are no oh sorry. Maybe Okay, yes, so, so yes. Uh, so in a Delaunay triangulation, uh, every triangle of the Delaunay triangulation has the property that the circle through the three points uh, is empty, but every edge has the property that there is a circle through the two points that's empty, and every pair of points that has such a circle is an edge of the Delaunay triangulation. So, so this edge is not certified and this one is not certified, but this one is actually certified. And, and because of this, actually, we know that at least one of those edges must be in the Delaunay triangulation, but we don't know which one. Okay. Um, okay, so why is this, uh, this useful, the fact that this 
graph is connected? Well, um, remember we computed this minimum spanning tree of P and now for every pair of uh, points in this minimum spanning tree, we want to reconstruct some part of the Delaunay triangulation that connects those points. Um, we do this by processing the tree by uh, increasing length of their edges. Okay, so suppose we have some uh, pair of points and their uh, Gabriel, uh, their expanded Gabriel disk, and there are some other set of points whose uh, centers lie in this disk, and we pre-computed this list. Now what we want to do is connect this point with this point, or compute some part of the Delaunay triangulation that connects them. So how do we do it? Well, we compute the, the uh, set of real points, and um, maybe we don't know for sure that there is a, a direct edge between those points, but we know that there is some path in the Delaunay triangulation that connects this point with this point by this lemma that we just proved, right? Because the red points is some set of points inside this disk, and it has this property that we can find this path of certified edges. Okay, the only question is uh, uh, how do we find this path? Uh, so if PQ is a short edge, then the number of points in here can only be constant by a simple packing algorithm that can, uh, argument. There cannot be too many disks, uh, unit disks inside this green disk if the disk is small. Uh, so we can just uh, do this in brute force. So if it's short, no matter how many points are there, we just draw all the uh, real points and compute the Delaunay triangulation and we just uh, check which edges are certified, and we look for some path in this graph. And this just takes constant time. Problem is, not all edges are short. Um, if the edges are long, then we, uh, we cannot do this directly, and then we have to uh, do a more uh, a careful argument uh, that still takes only linear time in the number of uh, regions, uh, disks in this region. And here the idea is that uh, because PQ is an edge of the minimum spanning tree, we know there are no other points inside this loom shape here. Um, but there may be many other points here and there. And now we want to find some connection from P to Q using some Delaunay edge from some point up there to some point up, uh, below here. Uh, but there may be quadratically many of them. Um, however, uh, we can still do, solve this problem so we, we know by uh, uh, the property of the minimum spanning tree that all of these red points are already somehow connected and these red points are already somehow connected. So we just need to find some pair of uh, points to connect and we can grow a circle from the center until it touches one point and then we grow another circle until it touches a point and then we find an edge between them and this gives us a connection between P and Q being a bit uh, uh, fast here about the details because I think we are out of time. Um, but using this, uh, we can now compute the whole Delaunay triangulation by taking our set of points, computing this minimum spanning tree, processing the edges uh, from short to long. So we have our, our real set, the red points. Uh, we take one of these Gabriel disks and we compute this Delaunay triangulation and we uh, keep going with the next shortest edge and at some point, um, so for every edge we process, we make sure that P and Q are connected in the Delaunay triangulation. And then if we've done this uh, for all edges, we have some connected subgraph of the Delaunay triangulation. And from this, we can reconstruct the Delaunay triangulation in linear time uh, by using uh, uh, linear time triangulation by Chazelle and then uh, compute the constraint to Delaunay triangulation by uh, Chen and Wang. And this is all linear time. And we are done. OK. Went maybe a bit fast in the end, but uh, are there any questions? There are questions, but no time to answer them. Hmm. OK, well, uh, thank you for your uh, attention. This uh, I should some uh, applications of the preprocessing paradigm and uh, hopefully this gave a, a different perspective on how you can deal with uh, uncertainty.